the shuttle slips into the final chapter of a storied 30-year adventure. I was working on a boat in Newport Harbor when I heard the crowd gasping in awe. I looked up in time to see the NASA behemoth 747 flying low over the beach with the space shuttle Endeavour piggybacking. The flyby was en route for Endeavour's final resting place at the California Science Center in LA. It didn't take long for my eyes to well up along with many others as the national pride broke into applause. For me, it was like watching the accumulation of my dad's career. He had so much to do with it and other aerospace programs beginning in the latter 50s. And I thought now is the time to shine the light on him and honor all the other engineers who figured it all out. Hear about the secret Air Force projects from behind the scenes with the engineer who was there on the ground floor. The manned space capsule, which became the Mercury program, the dinosaur space plane, which became the shuttle, and the man-orbiting laboratory telescope, which ultimately became the Hubble. Listen and hear about the acquaintances and friendships with Werner von Braun, Neil Armstrong, Robert Crippen, Jim Taylor, and Supersonic Smith. My dad, Roger Anderson, is in his 90s now and fighting off Parkinson's and dementia yet still sees the value of inspiring the next generations of engineers. Those are the ones who will do important things. Believe me, at this point in time, I can testify by my own personal experience that uh, a prayer now and then helps because uh, uh, you need all the help you can get on one of these missions. We have gone for a redundant set sequencer start. T minus 10, 9, we're on the cutting edge, technology and discovery. Five, four, we've gone for main engine start, we have. Dave Anderson here with uh, my dad, Roger, and uh, Mike, my brother. Mike and I wanted to uh, talk to dad a little bit uh, and record some of his uh, history and an understanding of what uh, got him into the space program. So with that, dad, I want to ask you a question. Tell us a little bit about your, your education, how you moved to California, etc. Okay. Well, in high school, I was uh, pretty good in mathematics and science, and from there, when I graduated high school, I went to go to the University of Tennessee. And I studied electrical engineering there. Uh, yeah, 50, I graduated in 52, 52. in December. Okay. And I went to work at North American in January the 19th mm -hmm. of 53 uh, with my degree. I had job offers, about 25 of them, from different companies around the east area, the east coast, midwest, in that area. But, I wanted to come to California. I was kind of fascinated with the climate and I wanted to uh, work in airplanes. The uh, airplane manufacturers were in California, Lockheed, North American, just uh, a number of them. The F-100 was the first thing that I worked on when I hired in North American and I was assigned to the instrument group as opposed to the electrical group. And the instruments were cockpit instruments and 
certain other devices like uh, fuel uh, flow and pieces of equipment we were responsible for. The uh, F-100 had an open mouth to take the air in. We, uh, the pedostatic tube, in order to get a good reading, it had to be well out in front of the air airplane. And it was pretty long. And when they taxied with it, it, was, it could bang into stuff. So we put a hinge on it to raise it up like this for taxi purposes. There are always a lot of EOs, engineering operations, changes that have to be made. Uh, but uh, on the instrument panel, I did a lot of uh, design work as far as drafting is concerned. We didn't have any computers to do our job for us, so uh, it was all manually uh, done, and I was very good at drafting. As far as the airplane was concerned, we had a few things that were instrumentation type, but the F-86D, it had rockets that were fired from the bottom of it, and uh, there was a certain angle that it would jump in the airstream, and they had a jump angle computer, and uh, we did enough tests uh, that things worked okay. Well, I worked there for about uh, six or seven years. I went from the production design area into advanced design. So we were working on the uh, what became the B-70. It's a weapon system 110A was the uh, original name for it. And uh, we built, ended up building two of those airplanes. And one of them was in a uh, flight demonstration with some other airplanes and they were close by and and one of the fighters rolled into the rudder oh. and it crashed. So we only had one left and it's gone to the Air and Space Museum in Ohio. Well, I moved on to uh, Boeing is where I went next. Up in Seattle. Yeah. I gathered up the family and moved up to Seattle. We enjoyed the most that the Northwest had to offer. We, we bought our house in the first housing tract that was built in Bellevue. We put fish craft and uh, we went salmon fishing. Oh, these pictures are of Neo Bay on one of our boating trips. Betty and I both knew that it would be better for raising kids in that area. In advanced design, we there was during that time period, the uh, Air Force gave us a contract to find all the requirements for putting a man in space. I wrote a substantial amount of that. We we had one great big thick book, and uh, that was our final report. Your your work product got used by someone else. Yes, we we had a contract from the Air Force to define it and uh, NASA became born during that time period. You know, we saw some pictures uh, that we had in storage of, of you in, in a uh, space suit. Oh. So that's you on the right-hand side and, and some assistance. Well, it was Scott Crossfield's space suit that I had on. It was the only one available where we could pressurize it because we didn't have any other space suits. It was July the 21st, 1958. Suit was designed for a sitting position, and uh, the sitting position was 90 degrees. It was uh, right after the Sputnik went, went over. The government transferred all of that type of work to NASA. Project Mercury was born October 7, 1958. 
program approval was granted one week after the establishment of the new National Aeronautics and Space Agency. You were really part of the part of this whole uh, race to space program, and, yes. and you were deep in the trenches of, of working on that uh, through different companies. Yeah. So what I had written in the proposal, because we had defined what was required for the uh, man in space. Yes, we responded with, to the RFP. Along with some other competitors. But uh, McDonald in St. Louis, they had a very low bid, unrealistic bid, yeah. for doing the job that was being requested. And, and they gave them the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, your bid was higher because you knew more about what it really took. Yes, yes. To we did, we looked a lot. We knew a lot more about what was required and what it was going to cost. Right. And uh, McDonald didn't really know anything to speak of about what was required, other than what we put in our report. It was a, a continual iteration of going back for more money. Uh, McDonald kept requesting more money once they got into the job and they realized what was involved. Right. And, and that, uh, that started to equate close to what your bid was in the first place, probably. Yes. <laughs> probably more. Yeah. But uh, the uh, NASA kept coming back and giving them more and more money. But they went to Congress and got it approved. and. Uh, we got left out of right. that uh, first effort. When I went to uh, Ohio, uh, that was a uh, just an assignment of six months mm -hmm. to go back there, and we were going to uh, monitor the design that uh, McDonald was going to do on the uh, Mercury. I designed a periscope for the Mercury project. And then the astronauts wanted a window. Uh, where are you planning on putting a window? Window? There's no window. No window. We were back there for six months and came back home. Off and the clock is starting. Yes, sir, reading a loud and clear. You know, they had the X-15 already flying, and they were we were going to build the dinosaur. The dinosaur later got the moniker of X-20, and uh, that's what we were going to build. And, and that would have been the first plane in space. Yes, it would have been the first plane in space. And they were, it was designed to uh, deorbit at different times and different ways so that it explored the entry corridor and the heating corridor. The exterior of the dinosaur was uh, very sophisticated. Uh, materials. They were heat resistant materials like titanium is one. There were other metals that are I don't remember the name of but uh, that covered the dinosaur and, and as it entered the atmosphere it would get hot. It had a big carbon, round carbon nose on it. Now the shuttle came along 30 years later and they put insulation on the outside of the vehicle to insulate from that heat. And, but the dinosaur didn't do that. It was a one-man vehicle. If they had uh, kept it as a, uh, sort of like the X-15, it would have survived and it would have been uh, way ahead of everything. At Boeing, working on the dinosaur, you also met the, uh, many of the astronauts that eventually became you know, famous, including yeah. Neil Armstrong. We had a meeting 
going on about the instruments on the dinosaur vehicle. And in walked Neil Armstrong. He invited himself to our meeting, and that's where I met him. And uh, we ended up uh, going out to lunch, and so we went to one of the little local places there and uh, enjoyed lunch. Somewhere along the line, but there, we, we saw an uh, organ sitting there on the, on the way into the lunch area. And uh, I mentioned that I was puttering around on the organ a little bit. <laughs> and Neil said that, uh, well, why don't you show us? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> enough to do that because I was doing everything from rote memory on how in the organ. And uh, he mentioned that he was piano type. Then later, he came to uh, fly the flight simulator at Boeing in Seattle. And uh, I used to see him occasionally on the, in the hallway uh, running around, you know. I never invited him to home, mm -hmm. which I wish I had. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't. Well, he, he told me that he didn't do signatures anymore. Charles Lindbergh advised him not to do signature. And he had ignored it for a long time. But then he finally, as he said, it got to be such a problem. He thanked you for reaching out to him. He remembered you. Pleasure to hear from somebody that knew what a dinosaur was. It, it got canceled because of the money problem and the Vietnam War. They soaked up all the money, and uh, so they canceled the dinosaur program. There was another guy there that uh, was Supersonic Smith. He's the one that uh, was taken off in an F-100, and he climbed up, and it's leveling off. But if the airplane went over like this, it started straight down. And he went supersonic, and he couldn't control it. He punch out? He punched out. But he was a uh, hanging limp in his suit. Uh, he had a pressure suit on. And they called him Supersonic Smith. And because of that, he, they kept him on the payroll. And uh, I remember he was working just down the aisle a little bit for me. Well, Jim Taylor was one of the my friends, close close friend, I would say, he was an astronaut, mm -hmm. but he got he got killed. He was taking a French aviator up in one of the new planes we have, and when he came back in to land, there was a turbulence remaining. There had been a, a C-5 had taken off earlier and it had a lot of residual turbulence. And when he was coming in to land, this uh, French pilot was flying it and the, he got, he clipped a wing on the runway. Mm. And he went barreling down the runway in pieces. And so Jim, uh, he had four children and uh, four daughters. and. But he was uh, one of the nicest people I've ever met. You know, from, from Boeing and the dinosaur program, what about, did you then evolve into the Mercury program or did you work on other uh, related programs? Well, we had work to do and studies we did, build a telescope. We did that from a preliminary standpoint only. Gave that to NASA. This was going to be a manned orbital telescope. It was going to be maintained by crews from the Gemini vehicle to come up and dock, and ultimately it was named the Hubble. And you had told us before that you had an opportunity to meet with uh, Warner Von Braun. When did that occur? That was uh, during the Mole program. Uh, at uh, McDonnell Douglas. I had a, uh, a big mock-up made and uh, for uh, determining how the lighting was all going to work. We had that mock-up there and 
when Werner von Braun came in, he was being ushered around to see things. Mm -hmm. And they wanted him to come to see the lighting mock-up that I had. So I got out of my sick bed at home. I was sick. No. I didn't go to work. I had to go and show him the mock-up. And then after that, I went back home, <laughs> went back to bed. What did he say? Oh, well, he was hard to get. Uh, he talked all the time. <laughs> he he, he yeah, really well. did. It's hard to get a word in edgeways. And uh, I answered his questions, whatever they were. But he was really impressed with uh, the little new switches that I had invented, you know, that were flush, where you'd have a flush panel and the recessed the top of the switches. People were going to be floating around, banging into it, so we didn't want uh, anything sticking up. Right. Really liked that. We're informed that the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, MOL program, has been canceled by the Department of Defense. Thrown ourselves into so much Just to make gone. The program was gone. It didn't feel good at all because we had spent a lot of time and effort and uh, to get to where we were and we didn't want to stop it all. You get something canceled like that, uh, it's very disappointing. It, you know, as, as good as it felt when I was selected, it uh, was uh, <laughs> 180 degree opposite of how, how it was when it went away. As disappointing as it was, all the data was considered ground floor for the International Space Station. When I came across Dad's handwritten resume, it felt like looking into a time machine as to his progression from the F-100 and F-86 Sabre jets to the advanced design aircraft such as the F-107 Interceptor and the B-70 supersonic bomber. That was impressive up to 1958. I was four years old when Sputnik was put into orbit sounding off those beeps. With the ground floor design of the Mercury capsule, was passed on to the newly formed NASA, which subsequently awarded to McDonnell Douglas. Roger went back to Boeing and was put on the dinosaur program and also the Man Orbiting Laboratory and Telescope. After both programs were canceled, he took that knowledge to the shuttle and formulated the critical system sequencing software for the four main computers that would light off the stack perfectly each and every time. I fell back in my seat and thought, wow, think of that responsibility. And that's why we are so proud of him. Take us into the space shuttle age and your involvement. My responsibilities on the space shuttle settled in from a broader range to a more narrow range. And uh, it involved the propulsion system on the shuttle and the interface with uh, deeply with uh, KSC and with the, the main engine people. All of this resulted in um, some of the things we needed to do with a shuttle, because you got a stack of uh, engines, three, the three engines that were uh, hydrogen and oxygen fed. Or the orbiter had to put the engines outward from the main body so that it could be started because the engines shuddered. They uh, bounced around and they didn't want them close together because the possibility of banging the, sh the shells, the hull. The leakage uh, is not on purpose, it just happened. When you got something like that, it, it leaks a little bit, the gas, and uh, we would burn off the, those gases. Now we have John Young and Bob Crippen. T-minus one minute, 35 seconds, and counting. Five, four, three, two, one. The whole shuttle computer complex was four computers all doing exactly the same thing. 
and they were all in sync. And if they got out of sync, well, the whole thing would shut down. We had a, a ground test of the boosters uh, horizontally on the ground. We did a lot of testing before they ever flew. The interface uh, with the uh, ground, uh, I was involved in that. Lunch program and they had great big pre valves that the fluid, the hot liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen came through. And I was involved in controlling those. And uh, like if we had a, an abort on the pad, we had to make sure those got closed because all that fluid in the tank could come on down and cause a big problem. Yeah. I was called in to explain how some of the things worked and uh, that was on a conference call with NASA. We did a lot of work through telecons. The, um, the launch responsibility was divided between the orbiter and the uh, ground. And the ground had certain duties, and uh, on orbit we had certain things that we had to do too, regarding to the countdown to the launch. Everything was being checked all the time, every 40 milliseconds. And if anything went wrong, by the, uh, there would be a hold called. You have 31 seconds due to a failure. We had a redundant set countdown sequence. We have gone for a redundant set sequence or start. Uh, loads on the hold down uh, equipment for the, uh, the whole stack. It bent over, came back, and then it got launched. And everything went straight for a long time. When the solid rockets lit, it's kind of like getting shot off an aircraft carrier. And there's another ride like it. We had to throttle down a little bit at one point uh, during the launch. Would that be called Max Q? The Max Q, yes. Mm -hmm. Because of the loads on the vehicle, air loads. Then it would be throttled back up after that point. Atlantis, go at throttle up, no action, DP, DT and go on into orbit. And once we got up into orbit... ...downrange, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. It reached a point where we were jettisoning the boosters. We had the solids along the way. The jettison first uh, took us on into orbit. Booster officer confirms staging a good solid rocket booster separation. So, you finish your career at Rockwell, uh, after the space shuttle program was well on its way, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, took an early retirement, and uh, you haven't missed the the space race since. Right? No, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really kept up with it. I canceled my Aviation Week magazine. I took. Uh, I retired at sixty. Do you have any idea you would wind up doing this much stuff in the space program? No, not really. Not at all. I'm very satisfied with the work that I have done. Uh, because you're accomplishing something that's very important. <laughs> Classes you have to take and pass uh, are all there. Hard work and discipline is required to become an engineer. Some people are going to be able to make it and some won't. Yeah, you do the best you can.
Did you yep. get a picture, okay. Mike? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who's here from Washington State? <laughs> My little sissy. That's right. <laughs>